Going all the way back to the 1940s, this country's blood system was essentially in the hands of the Canadian Red Cross. It took blood donations from volunteers and supplied the blood to hospitals. But a few decades ago, it became apparent that thousands of Canadians were infected with HIV or hepatitis C because the blood they were getting was tainted. Joining us now to explain how this happened and why Canada's blood system is safer today, Graham Scherr, he is Chief Executive Officer with Canadian Blood Services. Antonia Swan, whose husband, James Kreppner, died six years ago this month from tainted blood. Mike McCarthy, who led the political and legal efforts for compensation and justice, and himself has hepatitis C because of a tainted blood transfusion. And Globe and Mail health columnist Andre Picard, who chronicles the story in his book, The Gift of Death, confronting Canada's tainted blood tragedy about this country's worst ever preventable health care crisis. And I'm glad all of you could spare the time to come in and be with us at TVO tonight to review the events of two decades ago plus. Mike, we always start when you're on this program with the following full disclosure. Who's your business partner? Francesca Grasso, your lovely wife. Thank you. We get that on the table for people to know. Let me continue with you. Where are you from? I'm from St. Mary's, Ontario. What condition were you born with? Hemophilia, and I, was, uh, I had a sort of a mild variation of the disease. It's hereditary, and uh, you're missing a factor in your blood, and so it, you do not uh, heal from uh, cuts or, or bruises as easily as the public does. So in terms of staying healthy, what does that mean for you? Well, it means not being able to play hockey, despite my great road hockey skills growing up. Uh, but it did mean that I would require medicine uh, to control my bleeding, which was uh, factor eight, which was a type of concentrate that was made from uh, plasma that was donated uh, uh, through the Red Cross. How did you get hep C? Well, in, in this particular infection that I got in 1984, it was traced to uh, prisoner's blood in uh, Arkansas in the United States in a prison that was collected and sent to Canada for processing. And I was infected with that uh, lot of uh, plasma that was collected at a prison. What were we doing buying blood from prisons in the southern United States and bringing it up here? Well, at the time, I'm not sure why anybody was uh, using this plasma, and Canada was actually the only country in the world using this at uh, the height of the AIDS crisis in 1984. It was a commercial enterprise, and uh, a lot of people don't know it, but blood is worth billions of dollars uh, in the commercial sector for the development of uh, pharmaceuticals and other uh, blood products. When that blood was going into your body, did you have any reason to believe it wasn't safe? Well, we started hearing stories in the early 80s about uh, some uh, concerns about people getting sick from, um, uh, you know, uh, high-risk donors and that uh, it was like a one in a million type of uh, analogy that the Red Cross gave us, nothing to worry about. but. With the advent of AIDS in the, you know, North America, there certainly was some concerns, but we were reassured repeatedly by the Red Cross that our blood was safe. And you trusted the Red Cross? At the time I did. At the time you did. Antonia, you want me to call you Smudge, right? That's your I nickname. Do. Yeah. <laughs> You've been Smudge all your life. Where are you from? I'm from Toronto. Uh, I grew up in Winnipeg. When did you first meet James Krepner? Uh, in high school in uh, about 1981. So you were how 80, old? 81. Uh, I was 18 when I met him, but he was the guy I didn't know very well that wouldn't come to class too often. <laughs> but, uh, and this is the guy you eventually married? Yeah. When did, oh, you, get, yeah. When did you get married? <laughs> we didn't officially ever marry, but we were common law for 26 years. Okay. So. Did you know when you got together with him that he had hemophilia? I did. Uh, he asked me to the prom, the formal, as we used to call it, uh, and on the way in his uh, little plastic bub bubble car machine, whatever, uh, pacer, he, he casually, that was the first time I'd actually talked to him, and he casually said, just in passing, oh yeah, I'm a hemophiliac, and he explained, because I, I was really ignorant, I didn't know what hemophilia was all about, I thought you bled to death with a cut. He explained it, and he was so cool and matter of fact about it, and I thought, wow, this guy is cool. He just, you know, took it in stride. But in terms of his wanting to stay healthy, mm -hmm. did he explain what that would entail? Yeah, he, he, um, he sort of, he mentioned that, that he had to take certain specialized blood products for to control internal bleeding hmm. yeah so what happened to him what what year does he think mm -hmm. he got the bad blood 
Uh, James estimated he, pro he probably got infected in the mid 80s. Um, he, the reason he didn't know exactly when was that as a hemo severe hemophiliac, he, uh, he used multiple blood products over many years from birth. And mm -hmm. so we couldn't pinpoint it, but uh, probably in the mid 80s was the first. Now, does he, did he know, as Mike knows, where the blood came from? James never knew, so uh, he never uh, you know, got a lot number that could trace the origin. But certainly there was a chance it could have come um, you know, from the Arkansas prison blood, the Cummings prison. Um, but uh, yeah, so James wouldn't, yeah, didn't know for sure, though. And when he got the tainted blood, what conditions did he also, or diseases did he also contract then? James got both HIV and hepatitis C through tainted blood. How old was he when he found that out? Uh, he was about 20, 24, 25. Um, and he was in the middle of going to law school at Osgood Hall. We were in uh, residence together and, uh, when he found out. But he didn't actually get sick or feel the symptoms till 91. So. Because in the mid 80s, if you got HIV, yeah. I mean, essentially, that was it, right? Yeah, that was a death, you know. But we were under the, um, we were under the, the hope that uh, we'd hear things like, one, oh, it's one in a million that you get infected. And then we were, we were told basically that, you know, maybe, he, or there was a hope that uh, hemophiliacs uh, would get a special strain of the virus that wouldn't be as, as virulent that was as, as the rest of the community who was being, which was being infected. Um, but, uh, you know, that hope turned out to be, you know, there was no... Eventually, it was the real AIDS that, that uh, manifested and wreaked havoc because he almost died three times in the 90s. But at the time, in the early 80s, or in the mid-80s, yeah. he didn't necessarily think it was a death sentence. No, uh, we were, you know, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, he used to make fun of his brother, Walter, who, who also passed away through tainted blood, but of hep C, um, calling Walter a Luddite because Walter chose to, you know, brothers bantering around, uh, chose to stick with cryoprecipitate and older technology, but which used fewer donations, fewer, fewer donors, so it was safer. Um, and James thought, oh, I want to move with the times and the new technology because, of course, it gave hemophiliacs a new product, more freedom to, uh, to, to get around and have a normal life. Um, so. When he got sick, what did he resolve to do with the rest of his life? Well, James was um, called, well, he got called to the bar, he articled with the Department of Justice and was asked back, but he got too sick to continue. So uh, after having gone through law school, he decided to use his, like AIDS radicalized him once he got sick. He decided to use his legal skills, his advocacy skills uh, to, to fight for justice, basically, about to find out what happened. Why, why did this happen? Why did people, thousands of Canadians get tainted blood? How old was he when he died? He was 47, 2009, May 14, so two, it would be two days away. Andre, what exactly happened to render the blood supply tainted? Well, it's a very complex story. There's many factors. But the, the main thing is just uh, probably wishful thinking. You know, there was this uh, virus came along called HIV. Uh, it infected the blood. We had some hints that it was going to be a bad thing, but it just wasn't taken seriously. It was seen as a, a disease of gay men. Yeah, maybe it's transmitted in blood, but uh, you know, it's not going to be as bad for other people and so on. So there's a lot of mythology, a lot of wishful thinking, uh, a lot of uh, self-preservation of the bureaucracy. So, you know, you heard Mike say, oh, the risk is only one in a million. This was a lie that was perpetuated for many years. Purposefully? Uh, like in, uh, in yes. knowing, knowingly, incorrectly? Uh, at, at a certain point, yes, it became a knowing lie. Uh, by the time they finally did testing at the Red Cross, the risk was about one in every 200 units. That's a pretty far cry from one mm -hmm. in a million. It was a very bad game of roulette, and, and people were misled. And there was, you know, it's a massive bureaucracy. There was this organization that was run in a militaristic fashion where you could never question any decision. Uh, there was a desire to not alarm the public. Some of it was well-meaning, but it was all wrong in the end. And it was, it is, as, a, as you said in the outset, the worst public health tragedy ever in Canada. Actually, you know who I'm quoting and saying that? <laughs> you said it. Many people have said it. Well, <laughs> I got it from you. How many people do you think have been victimized by the tainted blood scandal? Well, directly, uh, roughly about 2,000 hemophiliacs. It's devastated the community. It's a, sort of the holocaust of hemophilia, if you will, around the world. Uh, then about 20,000 others, we think, have hepatitis C. Could be as high as 60,000 because it's a, an illness that takes a long time to, to show itself. And that's only the direct victims. There's their families, their children, their communities. It's a massive, massive uh, scandal and, a, and a, a disaster in every way, socially, culturally, economically, you name it. Why do you think um, so much of the establishment of this country, be it political, be it bureaucratic, be it the institutions, 
whose job it was to keep people safe, turned a blind eye to all of this? Well, I'd say if you had to explain it in a sentence, it was that we loved the Red Cross with all our heart. It was an iconic organization. It did so much good in the world, and it still does. And it took this little aspect, and it botched it from beginning to end, unfortunately. Hmm. And we, we can't sugarcoat that. You know, I I'm try, try to be careful when I talk about the Red Cross. It's a fabulous organization, but you can't forgive anything that it did in this instance. It failed from beginning to end, and thousands of people died as a result. Graham Sherm, Canadian Blood Services, what's your mission? Our mission is to manage the blood system in Canada today in a way that retains the trust, confidence and commitment of Canadians by managing a safe, secure and accessible supply of blood and blood products. And that emphasis on the word trust in our mission is precisely because of what we've just heard from the first three speakers. Uh, I, I completely agree with Andre's characterization, but at the end of the day, the trust of Canadians in this part of their public health system was lost. So our mission is premised on building, regaining, and retaining trust by managing a safe and secure supply. So when the Red Cross lost that trust 20 plus years ago, your organization was created essentially to pick up the ashes and regain it? That's exactly right. We were started as a, a, new, a new organization, essentially a new executive team, new governance, new board of directors, and our primary mission was to regain that trust by building safety, security of supply, and access into the system where it had clearly failed Canadians in the past. Do you, do you buy blood from prisons in Arkansas still? No. You don't do that? No. Where does your supply come from now? So blood, fresh blood components, red blood cells, platelets, plasma, comes exclusively from Canadians and comes exclusively from unpaid donors. Our volunteer donor base of about 410,000 Canadians who are regular donors. We buy plasma derivatives. These are drugs made from plasma. We buy that on the commercial market in addition to the, the products we manufacture in this country. And that does come from the commercial plasma industry in the United States. But it's a very different industry from what was going on in prisons in the 70s and 80s, which was had lax uh, safety controls, lax uh, regulatory oversight. Today, this is a, a very different industry uh, than existed 20 and 30 years ago. Who do you answer to? So I answer directly to an independent board of directors. I, I have a board of 13 Canadians uh, appointed and selected by the ministers of health on the, of the provinces and territories with the exclusion of Quebec. And the ministers are the shareholders or the members of our corporation. But my accountability is to an independent board of directors that operates at arm's length from government, free to make decisions, absent of any political interference in our decision making. And again, that independence and autonomy a very important part of our governance. I noticed you didn't say the Federal Minister of Health was part of that. Are, are you... No, the federal, the, the federal government through Health Canada and the Federal Minister is the regulator of the blood system. So in Canada, blood is classified as a drug under the Food and Drugs Act. So the regulatory authority is vested in the Federal Minister. The sort of members of the corporation, the shareholders, are the provincial and territorial ministers of health. What's your budget? Our budget is about a billion dollars a year. About half of that goes to manage the fresh blood supply of the business. About 450 million, almost 500 million goes to the purchase of plasma derivatives to treat hemophilia, immune deficiency, and a variety of other diseases. And then smaller portions go to manage our stem cell program, our research and development program, and others. And to be clear, this money is all funded by, or virtually all funded by the provincial governments? Provincial and territorial and ministries of health uh, through their uh, health budgets, yes. And, and let's be crystal clear about this. Canadian Blood Services, the organization that you run today, did it have anything to do with what we've been talking about so far? Well, uh, no, in terms that we didn't exist in all the decision making that Andre and Mike and Smudge have just talked about. When Canadian Blood Services was created, and we took over from the Red Cross, we did take over the personnel who previously had worked except for the management team. I was hired as a new executive along with a number of colleagues and a new board of directors. We took over the assets of the Canadian Red Cross Society, but none of the legal liabilities, none of the decision-making rights, none of the senior executives. It was a complete clean slate, fresh start uh, essentially building on the recommendations of Justice Creever. And we'll talk more about him in a second, uh, Justice Creever, because he did the Royal Commission look into all of this. Uh, 
One last question on something you said a moment ago, which is th the blood that you deal with all comes from volunteers. Correct. Why do you think it's important that the blood you deal with is all voluntarily donated as opposed to having people paid to give their blood? So again, we need to distinguish blood from plasma in this discussion. But today, going back to the 1970s and a very uh, famous study done in the United Kingdom at the time called the Titmus study, which showed that donors who were paid to be blood donors had a negative incentive for donation. So the, the money was an incentive to donate and it would potentially draw into the blood donation system individuals who might otherwise not be suitable as blood donors for a variety of risk factors. So this notion of what is called volunteer non-remunerated donors is essentially the global standard for blood systems today. And every country aspires to operate in a voluntary non-remunerated system. Canadian Blood Services has always adhered to that and will always adhere to that. Again, there is a paid commercial plasma industry, which is a very different uh, industry, but this notion of not paying donors is to divorce any negative incentive from the, the voluntary act of donation. You really want individuals who are doing this for none other than the opportunity to potentially help a recipient in need. So for us, it's very important to to stick to that principle. Yes, it's old, it dates back to research done in the 70s in the United Kingdom. I would argue today it is still a valid perception that you don't need to pay donors in order to run an effective and accessible supply of blood and blood products. Um, and there's really no reason to go back to that negative incentive. There are some countries where they try and offer incentives, uh, non-financial incentives, but certainly we at Canadian Blood Services don't do that. Mike, let's talk about justice. Sure. Ever since this scandal broke, you were basically one of the main guys who was out there trying to get justice uh, for people who had been infected by this tainted blood. What did you want to see happen? Well, first of all, I wanted to see people get help more than anything uh, because they were really sort of cut adrift by government and institutions that refused to admit that there were mistakes that were made that led to their infection. And you know, it was it was just not just uh, moral help. It was financial aid to to support the fact that they would no longer be able to work or support their family, or th have some monies to provide some health care to to help them through their uh, you know their personal journey of living with HIV or hepatitis C. And while it was easy to, in one respect, it was easy to fire the Red Cross and set up a new system because that was pretty obvious that they dropped the ball and, and the results were uh, catastrophic for the recipients of blood. Uh, it was much harder to get justice for, for the folks that uh, got infected through the blood supply and that took many years to, to finally culminate to a large degree in everybody at least getting some help from some level of government in Canada in terms of financial aid for the infection that they got. And every time you would go meet politicians, they would, you know, give, you know, they were afraid of the story, but uh, nobody wanted to admit that they were responsible for it for obvious reasons. And so there wasn't a lot of heroes in government. And it's, it's funny that, uh, the real heroes are somewhat uh, cascaded in the eyes of the public and politics these days. Mike Harris came to the rescue of Tina Bud victims in Ontario. Lucien Bouchard did in, in Quebec. And um, Prime Minister Stephen Harper did uh, for the forgotten victims uh, for their, all of Canada. And when you say that, do you mean they... They provided financial ahead. support to people that were harmed through the blood system. How much? Uh, well, in Ontario, it was up to $200 million. In Quebec, it was $100 million. In Stephen Harper, it was $900 million. And to give some credit to Jean Chrétien, who was, a, uh, was an obstacle of getting help to everybody, at least some people got help initially after the Carriever inquiry, and a billion one was given to a segment of people that were infected where the government originally admitted they were at fault, and that was between 1986 and 1990. There was a couple small compensation packages for HIV in the early 90s, and they were uh, done through the federal government and the provinces, mostly because the handful of people that had HIV, uh, the 2,000 or so, so weren't expected to live long and so it was a really a compassionate program for those folks and of course they had to sign a waiver and they weren't allowed to sue after taking the money uh, but justice took a very long time but we didn't didn't have to fight on our own the uh, the uh, RCMP got involved and and they believed that they 
seen uh, decisions that were made during the uh, contamination of the blood supply in Canada that was more than just ignorance or uh, blind faith in science. Uh, there was a lot of instances where there was incredibly bad decisions made that led to the loss of life and health of people collecting in prisons at the height of the AIDS crisis, leaving safe supply of heat-treated blood products in a warehouse and using up uh, unheat-treated, potentially AIDS-infected blood products to the last box so that they could get rid of their old inventory. So not just ignorance, but, but criminality. Some, there was, and there was a criminal conviction, a federal conviction against the Red Cross, which truly was the only conviction that we ever got out of the, uh, the criminal trials in Canada related to the disaster. Andre, help us understand this, because if, if it was the Red Cross that blew it here, uh, why did the, where is the government's responsibility in therefore having to compensate victims? Yeah, so the Red Cross wasn't alone. Uh, there was a regulator, which is the federal government, which failed in its entirety to regulate this properly. Uh, there were the provinces who had something called the Canadian Blood Agency, which was doing the oversight. Uh, they botched it monumentally. They essentially did nothing. It was a hands-off. We'll leave it to the Red Cross. So the, there's a lot of failure to go around. The Red Cross has become the symbol of this, but no, nobody distinguished themselves in this. And it, it was very, very costly. So in the end, uh, when you have public disasters, the, the public treasury pays. And you heard Mike gave a very brief litany of some of the programs. Uh, this has cost taxpayers roughly $5 billion, above and beyond the death and the destruction. There's a lot of money involved. So had they used that five billion perhaps to ensure the safety of the blood supply, fill in the blank, right? Dot, well, dot, the dot. frustrating thing is it would have taken a pittance. Right. Would okay. have taken a yeah. pittance because uh, things like you didn't have to use up the blood. Right. They that cost what hundred thousand uh, dollars at a time when one in every couple of hundred people were being infected. You could have prevented hundreds of infections. Hmm. Just very little uh, minor things could have been done. Could have made a big, big difference. Smudge, the name uh, Horace Creever has come up a couple of times already. Mm -hmm. He was appointed to essentially chair the Royal Commission that looked into all of this. Right. How significant was all of that to the justice that people wanted and got at the end of the day? It was huge. It was probably the number one big win that, uh, frankly, that we got through the years. Um, that made James, my late husband, very, very happy and, and renewed his sense of, you know, there is justice. We are going to get to the bottom. Um, Horace Creever himself said it wasn't a witch hunt, but what we did find out was what, where did the system fail? You know, there was a lot of buck passing when James testified. I remember him at Creever, uh, the commission. Uh, he remember, I remember him saying, um, you know, we should put a wash basin up here so that everyone can come up and wash their hands of responsibility because as Andre said, you know, there was two, there wasn't one entity that you could say, you know, this is an emergency, we got to act, and not one place where you could pin it down. But bottom line, Creever got the truth out, and uh, f you know every penny is worth it. Uh, we now have a better understanding of what not to do again in this country. And I, I think um, you know, one of the reasons I, I kind of wanted to be part of this was I was in a, a writing course, and uh, I'd written a piece, a personal piece, about um, stuff with James and, and in it I mentioned Creever and one of the younger students in the class, she was probably 20 something, she was reading it aloud and she said Crever and I thought holy cow that generation probably has no idea and this is why I, I mean this is why I'm here is that I, I don't want this to happen again and James certainly didn't because uh, he worked alongside Mike and John Plater another amazing person and others you know to, to fight for Creever to get the we had to f fight to get Creever, fight to get the, the the uh, the report out there, you know. So it was a it was a battle all the way. But bottom line, to answer your question, yes, that that sense of what Horace Creever did and the, the recommendations. I want everybody, you know, you just have to pick it up and and look at the recommendations and follow follow what he said. It's what do you say was the uh, s significance of the Creever inquiry? Oh, uh, monumental is the word Smudge used, and I would echo that. Not only did it bring justice, as we've heard, but I think what uh, Justice Creever's recommendations did, and remember he wrote two reports. He wrote an interim report in 95 and then a final report in 97, and there was a total of 97 recommendations between these two reports. They completely defined what a blood system should be. It was the blueprint, the roadmap, detailed recommendations in terms of setting up appropriate governance structures, operating entities, funding arrangements. It was a very clear uh, blueprint for the creation of the new National Blood Authority that became Canadian Blood Services, clear delineation of roles and responsibilities. You heard Andre talk about nobody knew who was in charge. Nobody was really accountable for decision making. He was crystal clear in defining recommendations that would set clear roles and responsibilities. 
and I've had the pleasure of meeting with Justice Creeper a few times over the years, and I remarked to him uh, a few years ago that not only did his report actually define the creation of the new blood system in Canada, but it actually became, and still is to this day, the blueprint for blood systems internationally. So I do a lot of collaborative work with blood systems in the UK and Australia and the Europe. They still refer to the Creeper Report. And who, they who appointed him? Um, he was appointed by the federal government at the time, by Prime Minister uh, Creighton in the, at the time. Um, and then he worked from about 93, I think, was when he started his yeah. work. Um, no, actually, he was appointed in the Mulroney a, government. Um, he was appointed by Kim Campbell Kim, when oh, she was back the last act as health minister. That's, that's right. Huh. Um, okay. That's quite right. Yeah. But then worked through the Mulroney years and tabled uh, first report in 95 and then final one in 97. Uh, Andre, has anybody gone to jail? Has anybody been punished? Anybody been fined? Anybody been fired? What's, you know, what's the fallout there? So in Canada, no one has gone to jail. That's happened in other countries like Japan and France. There's been here, as Mike mentioned, there was one minor criminal prosecution against an institution, against the Red Cross. Uh, the punishment has mostly come through uh, the public, the court of public opinion. And that's been a pretty effective punishment, I think, because it's, it's allowed people to get, you know, to not wash their hands of it, but get the truth come out there. That was so important to the victims that they weren't forgotten anymore because they were really swept under the carpet. I think that was the most important part was the public uh, demonstration of it, that Creever did his uh, inquiry for a long time very publicly. Having said that, would you, Mike, like to have seen somebody go to jail over this? I, I think that to uh, Andre's point that uh, it was almost like war, war crime trials. Most of the participants were very old. Uh, I think justice would have been better served if we would have seen uh, uh, harsher penalties. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do believe that the uh, Justice Creever actually creverized the health system. That's what uh, is used widely in the health system now. Is creverized. Creverized, and that is you don't wait for the body count to right. make decisions right. to save people's lives. Mm -hmm. That you need to uh, act in uh, accordance to uh, evolving and emerging uh, evidence that uh, there could be a public health crisis on your hands. And the, you know this is about now protecting the public now and into the future. And we believe that the CBS has done a, a, a tremendous job up to date Canadian to, blood services. Uh, to take the, the ashes of the Red Cross and, and, and regain confidence for the blood supply so people can feel with confidence that they can get treatment and care and, and transfusion uh, medicine that they don't have to worry about, is this next drop of blood going to make me sick? Um, I have only one really concern in terms of where we go in terms of the blood system, and that is in times of austerity, and as we've seen in the past, we had uh, the meddling of politics into the budgets of the Red Cross, and, and I am worried that austerity will put pressure on the Canadian Blood Services to, to not that it's a conscious thing, but you can see a bit of uh, creep uh, returning into the mentality of governments as they forget the past in terms of dictating to the uh, Canadian Blood Services to find savings in the system and the pressure that puts on Graham and his colleagues there to run a safe and, and efficient blood system it can be compromised as it, as it has in the past. So what Smudge brings to the table and, and other uh, f uh, victims that were harmed through the blood system is a, a kind of advocacy that's a, it's a vigilance piece that uh, we're there to remind the public that this could happen again, that if all you know unintended consequences uh, end up being a focal point of bad decision making, we could see people in harm's way again. And we certainly don't want that. And I'm not suggesting that the blood system's unsafe. It's just, you know, in times of austerity, uh, strange decisions do take place. Let me put that to Graham. Uh, how immune from political interference are you, really? It's a great question. And, you know, as I said earlier in my remarks, we were set up to be an arm's length relationship. And, it, and the question is, how long is that arm and does that arm shorten in times of austerity, to Mike's point? Um, we are immune to the extent that we are free to make the operational decisions in the best interests of the system. The ministers of health retain the ultimate authority to grant us our budget to operate and to appoint and fire my board of directors. They have that authority. They have not exercised it because we believe we have always acted in the best interests of the system. Your budget's not been cut? Our budget has not been cut. We have voluntarily driven efficiencies into our operation and we have seen our budget go down by 1.3 percent this past year and about a, a couple of percentage points the previous year. So your budget as has a, been cut? As a result of in deploying new technology, new processes, driving efficiency into our operation, not as a result of political 
cuts to our budget. Has there been a diminution of services as a result of Absolutely that? Absolutely none whatsoever. None. There's been an enhancement of service, a deployment of technology, meeting hospital needs. I share Mike's concern. It's a very important one. As we move 10 and now 20 years away from uh, Justice Creever's report and the whole history of the, the tainted blood scandal, governments come and go, as we all know, and, and ministers and deputy ministers of health have very short half-lives in this country. So there is a, di a, a diminishing memory of the tainted blood scandal in Justice Griever. Our, for our part, we remind governments all the time of our legacy and where we came from. When I do new employee orientation at Canadian Blood Services, we always begin with a discussion of Creever and what it means, even 20 years later. This is a, this is a memory we cannot forget. This is a to use the term, a creverized philosophy that has to drive the decision making we make today. Are we completely and totally immune from the politics of healthcare? Only to the extent that we preserve that operational, independent, and arm's length relationship from governments. And we have fought for that in the past. Let me hear Andre on that as well. Are they as immune from politics as they would like to be and hope to be? Well, I think as, uh, they're as immune as they can be, mm -hmm. in the, you know, realistically. What's changed most dramatically is the culture. So that's what Creever changed. He changed the culture. Uh, CBS is transparent in a way that the Red Cross never was. It was secretive, uh, obsessively secretive. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that in itself is really important. Then there's the technological, technological changes. And probably the most important thing that we don't talk about is we use a lot less blood now. One of the realizations that came from this, you know, the saddest chapter in my book is a chapter about a boy who got one tablespoon of blood, a top up to put some color in his cheek and you know 25 years later now has AIDS. You know that's we used to do that kind of stuff routinely. Now we're careful. We treat blood as we should treat it like any other drug with benefits and possible harms. Hmm. So that those changes are really really dramatic and we don't necessarily see them or talk about them, but they're really important. In terms of the next shoe to fall, if I can put it that way, is this story done? Well, this story is never done because there's always new pathogens. You know, we worry, well, could Ebola be in the blood? You know, it won't be because it's the way that the disease ramps up very quickly. There's not a risk to the blood system. But we don't know what the next AIDS is. But have, the, all, the, have all the victims been compensated so far? Well, no, there's a lot of uh, unfinished business. Uh, Mike will tell you about uh, there was money transferred from Ottawa to the provinces, which was never passed on to the victims. They should be getting today the, the state-of-the-art hepatitis drugs, and they're not getting them. That agreement's crystal clear, and it just hasn't been respected. So it's a lot of unfinished business. Why isn't that happening? Well, because government really just threw money at a problem to make it go away off the front pages of the newspaper. They really didn't have the kind of commitment that was necessary to, to help people get over what happened to them. And that was probably the biggest stumbling block that's been part of the story is that it could have been so easy to, because the public wanted to embrace the victims and they felt their pain because everybody had some touch point to the disaster friends, family, somebody they knew in the community, and it was totally unnecessary. And, and instead, government ran the other way and treated people very badly in one sense in terms of, first of all, denying any responsibility and then saying, oh, okay, we're responsible for a few but not others, and we had nothing to do with prison blood even though whatever. You know, we had a lot of excuses and a lot, lot less action. Uh, when we did get action, it was... Uh, you know, in response to political fights between the provinces or the federal government, and nobody wanted to fork the money over to, to help people. And at the, you know, at the end of the day, now we have a cure. We had, we had a government through, uh, instead of compensating to help people get on with their lives, they provided what they called Karen Sita Cash, Jean Chrétien's response to Mike Harris helping the forgotten victims in Ontario. And it was $300 million for enhanced care and treatment uh, for emerging treatments for hepatitis C. That was announced in 1999. 16 years later, not one penny went to the Tain of Blood victims. All this money was transferred into general revenues to provincial governments and hidden and put on the, the you know, other programs or what have you. Not a penny went to help Tain of Blood victims. Now we have a treatment that essentially can cure people of their, of their disease that the state gave them this disease. At the very least, they should be uh, taking care of these people so that they can get the treatment no charge, a decision between them and their physician and not some requirement on a public formulary in a province. It's a shameful kind of way to, to see the story, never really get an ending to it. And to me, that would be not quite a happy ending because there is no happy ending when people lose their lives and their health. 
but to at least allow people to move on with their lives and, and get the kind of treatment that's needed to, to at least what's left over to be somewhat uh, fruitful. Smudge, let me ask you the same kind of question. Uh, how much justice, in your view, has been done? How much justice must still be done? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of justice has been done, and thanks in large part to the Creever Report and the inquiry. Um, as Mike said, there are clearly unturned stones that th this issue is important. The, the Hep C cure is looking very promising, from what I know. Is this still a mission for you? Um, it's not directly related to me, but I see the injustice that he shouldn't have. You know, he, Mike and others shouldn't have to face uh, uh, after they got this disease uh, because of the fault of you know, people running the system initially and, and then they're being denied treatment. Uh, one thing I did want to add though is that um, James ended up, there is a tie between my late husband James, um, he got on the Canadian Blood Services Board so he was you know, one of the board members that Graham um, talked about and I think one of the things James always used to say is that when you, and James was, used to be 180 pounds, you know, kind of chubby and healthy and uh, six feet tall, went down to 118 pounds and you know, pretty skinny, sick looking guy. When you see a sick, skinny guy at the, at the board table with you making decisions about blood safety, it's one thing to, to not have that person at the table. When you see that person, you're making decisions about whether to implement, implement the next bloodborne pathogen test for the next disease. You know, we can, we can test for AIDS, Hep C, and, but there are other bloodborne pathogens. I mean, it's a safe system, but we gotta be vigilant about looking out. Some of them have incubation periods of decades. So when you see a sick, skinny guy at the table, you remember, oh, that's what happens when we screw up. That is, it's a, I'm an economist, right? Um, and so I'm interested in how incentives guide behavior. And, and there's nothing like a direct in your face, remember this is what happens when we screw up. So I'm, I think that the best, one of the things we could do, and I know there are consumer reps on the board of CBS, but I'd be happier if there were ongoing blood users or plasma use blood product users on the board that would use mm -hmm. blood products regularly because that way the incentives would be there. And it's not the same to, to sort of have one blood transfusion in the past. That doesn't make you concerned about blood safety. Let me ask Graham about that. Yeah. Were, were you at any of those meetings where James was I on your board? I was at all of them. I've been were. at every board meeting that James was there. And what what so kind I, of a director was he? A fabulous director. Not only was he that visual reminder that Smudge talks to, he had one of the sharpest minds, the most critical minds, never let an easy decision pass and always challenged decision making. So I, I certainly uh, echo uh, the sentiment that it is important that the blood system, and it's not just about me and my current board, but that the blood system have directors who are one, independent of government, and two, able to challenge the decision making. I think as Andre referred to earlier, one of the failings of the Red Cross is there was just no oversight at the governance level. We do have two positions on our board dedicated to consumer representatives. It is true that neither of those current positions is a hemophilia patient. Um, we also need to remember there are many other representatives of, uh, of recipients. They could be organ recipients, they could be bone marrow transplant recipients who get dozens of units of uh, transfusion through their care. Uh, they don't ha always have to be hemophilia patients. But there must be two uh, board members of consumer representation. That does come from Kriever's recommendation and it carried through to our bylaws and our appointment process today. I did want to make one other point because there was an important discussion around sort of the provinces and, and I agree that they have not fully accounted necessarily for everything that went on in the past. But I do want to take this opportunity to point out to the viewers that there is a system in place today that we haven't talked about that grants what was absent in the past and that is governments have set up what is called a contingency fund which gives the CEO of the blood service, so today me and my successor in the future, the ability to act at any point in time outside of any budget negotiation process and without any approval of any government in the name of safety. How much is in the contingency? $40 million. It was $20 million. We negotiated it up to a $40 million contingency fund based on what we know to implement a new test would be today. Do you ever rate it to balance your budget? Never. That's a political, uh, I shouldn't not. have said that anyway. Absolutely okay. not. We have uh, a few minutes left here. We started with personal questions and I want to end with personal questions. Uh, Mike, as a hemophiliac, was your life going to be shorter than a quote unquote normal healthy person's anyway? No, not with safe blood products. I was uh, destined to live a full life. And I just want to add, I, I lost two uncles to tainted blood during the scandal and they were supposed to have full lives and they would have if they wouldn't have had bad blood. Now that you've got hep C, what is your life expectancy? Well, I'm in, 
uh, I have compromised uh, hepatic system because of, I've had uh, a, a few decades of infection and uh, I need treatment and I'm going to take it whether I have to pay for it or not because I got to take care of my family. I still have kids at home. Um, but, uh, you know, if the treatment is successful and I've tried previous treatments that failed, but this is very promising, I expect I will, you know, hopefully get a couple more decades out of this. and. And just to let Graham know that I'll still be around uh, reminding him of, of his duty, and I, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. And, and I'll, you know, the one good thing about this was it felt good to be able to stand up and take some control of your life and try to help other people. And, and I know that James thought that way, and, and Smudge feels that way. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't all terrible, awful experience. I got to meet very courageous people. I made great friends. I did see people that tried to help from institutions and government that made a difference to, to make the system better. And so I do thank those people, and I do believe Canadians are incredibly generous in times of need like this. They did help. When you got infected, though, your kids weren't born yet, right? No. So at some point, did you tell them, here's what Dad is dealing with? Yes. They didn't quite understand it at the beginning. But when the TV camera showed up at the house and they got to be on TV with Dad, <laughs> they kind of felt a little special at the beginning. But they've seen me have uh, my uh, trials and tribulations in terms of my health and, and the angst of, you know, for many years being told, no, go away, we're not going to help you. You know, I had very dark moments in terms of wh where are we going to get justice and, and get help to people. And, and I think for them, they learned a lot of lessons from their dad that you never give up. I'm a little stubborn that way, but hmm. uh, if you believe in making things right, you never give up. And that's really the story of many blood victims that, that never gave up and told their story publicly. I think the one person in this discussion we still haven't heard from that we need to hear from is your late husband. Yeah. And through the magic of videotape, we will. Roll it, please. It's time that we give people the medical care that they're entitled to in this country and not stop making excuses. Stop trying to bury issues and not address them. That's my, that's, I hope I'm making a difference by saying that. Individuals with hemophilia who have end-stage liver failure would be entitled to get a transplant and would be given a transplant. Individuals with any type of viral hepatitis would be given transplants if their liver required a transplant. But because I've got this added factor of HIV, which doesn't seem to be a barrier anywhere else in the world, but in Canada it does seem to be a barrier, I cannot get a transplant. And I think the days of discrimination have to end in this country. What do you think when you see that? Hmm. Um. I think it's a shame that, uh, you know, of course I'm, I've got my bias, but uh, we really lost a good person with James. More broadly, I'd say that, you know, the issue behind what James was talking about, in 2011 we did, people who were HIV positive ultimately were allowed to, to have, tr be, you know, access to transplants if they needed them. So we changed that after a lot of lobbying. Um, but but the, really, the the essence of the issue is that the provincial government um, really didn't keep up with technology of AIDS and, and how well people were doing. They figured, oh, the person has AIDS, you know, they're not going to live long, why waste a liver? But with the advent of, you know, you don't have to give a whole liver, living donor issue, as well as the fact that, more importantly, the, the people were living longer with HIV, that that was really, it, there was no excuse anymore after the protease inhibitors and the new AIDS technology came along to, to deny people because simply because they had HIV on their state. So that killed him. James ended up dying of hep C, and he may be around today had we not, had our government kept up with, you know, science and, and of AIDS. And, and so I think it's a message to, to you know, to keep up. You, you have to be vigilant about keeping up with science. It's a, it's a challenging job. I, I'm not sure I could do it, but you really pick up Creever, stay on top of science. It's really good of all four of you to come in tonight and help us out with this. Thanks so much to Graham Sher, the CEO of Canadian Blood Services. Antonia Swan lost her husband James to tainted blood, Mike McCarthy, who led the efforts for compensation and justice, and André Picard, the gift of death confronting Canada's tainted blood tragedy. For more on this, read his book. Thanks, everybody. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.